Um, we had discussed a little bit uh, three massless particle representations of various supersymmetry algebras. We would do that in some detail in four dimensions. And then hopefully some of you uh, got, a, got a chance to think about some of the other cases that, that, that I mentioned. Um, and let me just summarize briefly what was the upshot of that discussion. Um, the upshot of that discussion was that um, massless three particle representations exist in dimensions four, five, and six, um, and satisfy the Weinberg-Wittenbound on the helicity, or the spin, if uh, we are in a theory with less than O equal to 16 supercharges. Uh, this is where this famous constraint on 16 supercharges comes from. Um, and there was a small um, uh, exception to this in three dimensions um, because in 3D uh, they exist for any script n. And um, I encourage you to think about why 3D is different. Um, and the, the simple answer is that in, in 3D, there is no notion of helicity for massless particles. So correspondingly, there is no Weinberg-Wittenbound. You can a act with as many supercharges as you want, and you'll still get an acceptable state. OK. Um, and then, toward the end of the lecture, we started contemplating the possibility that the quantum field theories, the supersymmetric quantum field theories that uh, we want to study, uh, don't arise necessarily from um, fixed, point of, uh, fixed points of the renormalization group in the UV that are just based on free fields or free particles or Lagrangians, but instead some possibly interacting uh, superconformal quantum field theories. So let me remind you a little bit about what we said about that. Um, as, as you by now know from a variety of lectures, the conformal algebra in D dimensions is SOG, comma 2. And we would like to supplement this with the SUSY algebra in whatever dimension we're in. Um, and as I briefly explained at the end of yesterday, uh, this combination uh, gives you not only more bosonic charges than the Poincaré group, it just also gives you more uh, fermionic supercharges than in the ordinary supersymmetry algebras we've discussed, um, because the Ks can be used to act on the Qs to, roughly speaking, give you Ss. So these are the ordinary Susie Qs that we've discussed so, so far. Usually, they're called Poincaré supercharges. And uh, in a superconformal theory, you can act on the Poincaré supercharges with the special conformal generators, the K mu's, and get the S's, which are usually called superconformal supercharges. Okay, so we have Q's and we have S's. So the uh, sort of number of supercharges has, in some moral sense, doubled. Um, and one thing I said quickly at the end of yesterday is that it's very useful to, to arrange Q and S into a single spinner object. And it turns out that this uh, double spinner transforms in a spinner representation of SOD, comma 2, in fact, in a minimal spinner representation of the conformal algebra SOD, comma 2. So just like the Qs themselves transformed as minimal spinners of Poincaré, the, uh, the Qs and the Ss together transform as minimal spinners of conformal. OK. So that was the first thing. And another thing we started discussing as well is that the um, the superconformal algebras also uh, always necessarily contain a large maximal or nearly maximal R-symmetry algebra. Uh, 
So in general, the um, superconformal algebra in D, D space time dimensions with n supersymmetries is some big super algebra, contains both bosonic and fermionic generators. These are the fermionic generators. Um, the bosonic subalgebra is SOD comma two, which is the conformal part, times the R symmetry, which as I've said is essentially always maximal, with one exception. Um, and moreover, from here we know that, that uh, let, let's call this object script Q script Q, which is the totality of odd generators of the superalgebra, is a spinner of SOD comma 2. So this is some superalgebra. OK. Um, now, one thing we could ask is, what Super algebras are there out there in the world of, of math super algebras that have been looked at that satisfy this requirement? Um, and it turns out that this question can be answered essentially for the, the following reason. Um, as I think both Balt and I have emphasized the, one of the nice features of the conformal algebra that is different from the Poincare algebra is that, that it has this nice. SO form, right, <laughs> instead of a semi-direct product form. Uh, so, uh, so that gives you um, a lot of addi additional structure. In particular, for the purposes of the argument that I'll be making right now, uh, I'm going to do something like a generalized Wick rotation, and I'm going to start ignoring the difference between the signatures of the D part and the two part, um, and just view this bosonic subalgebra as SO D plus 2 with some, perhaps some unusual reality or hermeticity properties. But structurally, at the level of the algebra, this is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. So if all you're asking is what are the possible superalgebras that contain these bosonic subalgebras, you might as well ask the question uh, for, for, for the case where you replace the conformal algebra by SOD plus 2. And that makes life a lot better because SOD plus 2 is a nice, compact, simple Lie algebra. Uh, so are the R symmetry algebras that we discussed. All of them are compact, simple Lie algebras. SON, SUN, SPN, etc. And this problem has been solved by mathematicians, uh, primarily by cats, but, um, but the, the totality of superalgebras that, that contain these compact bosonic subalgebras have been classified. And the classification fits on a page. It's not very complicated. I'm not going to write it out in complete detail because there are a few exceptional cases that we will not need and that can be easily ruled out from the physics point of view. For example, some of these, in some of these cases, it's obvious that the bosonic, that the fermionic generators do not transform as spinners of the con of the conformal part. Um, instead, I'm just going to give you the subset of the of the list that will be important for answering this question, namely, what are the possible superconformal algebras? So maybe I'll write that over here. So the superalgebras we will need are, are the so-called, well, with one exception, are the so-called classical superalgebras, and they have nice names. So the first one is called OSP M slash 2N. And this is a superalgebra whose bosonic subalgebra is SOM times SP to little n. And, the, uh, and of course, it also has fermionic generators, the superalgebra. Let me just call them Q, since that's, that's the context we're discussing. 
And the Qs have to transform in some way under both SOM and under SP2N. And it turns out that for OSPM slash 2N, the Qs are in, a, uh, in the fundamental of SOM, which means they're a, an M vector. And they're also in the fundamental of SP2N, which is a 2N dimensional era. OK? So that's the classical Lie superalgebra OSP M slash 2N. Um, and the second classical Lie superalgebra that we'll need is SU M slash N. Here there are two slightly different cases. Um, let me first discuss the case, the generic case, where M is not equal to N. When M is not equal to N, the bosonic subalgebra is SUM times SUN times U1. And the fermionic superchargers, the Qs, are a fundamental of both SUMs, so both SUM and SUN, so it's a bifundamental, and it carries charge one, let's say, under this U1 factor. And then there are Q, Q daggers or Q bars, which are in the anti-fundamental of both SUs and have U1 charge minus one. So let me just write the, let me just write the Qs here. And the exceptional case is when M is equal to N, And in this case, it turns out that the bosonic subalgebra is just SUM times SUM. No, you won. More precisely, what happens is that the U1 becomes a central element, and then you may or may not decide to set it to zero. Um, but the, the supercharges aren't charged under it. And again, the Qs are in a bifundamental of the two SUFs. Okay. So that's almost all we need, that we need one more entry. So as I said, as I said these two are, are classical Lie superalgebras. There's one exceptional Lie superalgebra as well. Um, let me just say sort of by way of context that this classification problem for Lie superalgebras, compact, uh, simple Lie superalgebras is very similar structurally to the Cartan classification of ordinary Lie algebras. And just as in that case, you have the classical series, and then you have a few exceptional entries as well. Um, and so th these are analogs of the classical groups or classical algebras. And then there's a you know, order five or six uh, exceptional entries. And we, we will only need one exceptional entry that I'll write down for you. It's called F4. The Lie superalgebra F4. Um, and its bosonic subalgebra is counterintuitively SO7 times SU2. It doesn't have anything to do with the Lie algebra F4. And the Qs transform as a spinner of SO7. And the fundamental of SU2. And as I said, there are a few other entries in this classification, but uh, they can all be ruled out from our physics point of view because the Qs don't obviously don't transform as spinners of anything. Okay, so now we have to stare at this list and decide um, under which circumstances uh, these these uh, superalgebras are compatible with this picture over here. And the case where this is most obvious, actually, is the exceptional case I wrote down for you, the F4 case. Because here we have an SO7, and we have a Q, which is a spinner of it. It just falls into our lap. So which case would this correspond to? Well, so remember that once we did this sort of double wick rotation, where we replaced SOD comma 2 by SOD plus 2, 
Um, the space-time dimension is the argument of the SO minus 2. So SO7 is appropriate for D equals 5. Okay? So this F4 case here is a candidate superconformal algebra for D equals 5. And let's try to figure out how many supercharges we have. Well, in five dimensions, remember that the uh, R symmetry algebra was SP to script N, where script N counts the number of minimal supercharges. And here, the R symmetry algebra is SU2, because the Q uh, spinner is also a fundamental of SU2, which is the same as SP2. Okay, And the box of SU2 is the same as the box of SU2. Uh, and that means that N is 1. So the, al the, the, the uh, super algebra F4 is the 5D n equals 1 superconformal algebra. Or, well, at this point, I should say maybe it's an algebra. You might ask, are there others? And the answer is no. Uh, this, is, this turns out to be the unique superconformal algebra in five dimensions with this amount of supersymmetry. <laughs> Um, now, it isn't obvious from what I've said so far, because we haven't discussed the other cases just yet. Yes, please. Uh, I'm about the Related with the uh, exceptional D algebra F4? No, I, I, I said that briefly. Uh, the, the F4 is the name of the super algebra, and it turns out that it, 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 the bosonic subalgebra has nothing to do with the ordinary. Lie algebra that, that's usually Thanks. denoted script F4, frac F4. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that once we go through this list, we'll see um, that there are no other candidate superconformal algebras in five dimensions. Okay, so we, in this list, once we are done analyzing it, It'll turn out that there's no other um, superalgebra with bosonic subgroup SO7 such that the, spin, uh, that the supercharges are spinners under. So this is, in fact, the um, unique 5D superconformal algebra. That's quite interesting. Because when we looked at the ordinary supersymmetry algebras, we saw that those existed for arbitrary script n at the level of the algebra that was clear. Um, what's somewhat more surprising is that you can actually write down supersymmetric Lagrangians in five dimensions with more than n equals 1 supersymmetry. For example, if you take maximally supersymmetric yang mills theory in five dimensions, which has the same amount of supersymmetry as 4d n equals to 4, uh, and also looks otherwise very similar. So if you wish 10D, 10D super Yang mills reduced to five dimensions, uh, that theory has, in this uh, notation, n equals two supersymmetry in five dimensions. So that, that's a supersymmetric theory in five dimensions, which has twice as much supersymmetry as, as this superconformal algebra. And what's the interpretation of this? Well, um, there's no inconsistency. Uh, it just means that Syst you know, physical systems with n equals 2 supersymmetry in five dimensions can never ever come from or flow to a superconformal fixed point. Is there a question here? Mm -hmm. So like uh, OSP M's bar to n case, we can make similar to F4 case in five dimension? No. You'll, we'll go through those cases in detail in just a second because they'll be important for the other dimensions, but you'll see that, you'll see that it doesn't work. Uh, I'll explain why in just a second. Um, let, me, let me just finish this comment about 5D n equals 2. Um, so so uh, you, have, you have interesting physical theories in five dimensions that are supersymmetric but are not trivially related to superconformal fixed points in five dimensions. And as some of you may know, the, the n equals to 2 maximally supersymmetric yang mills theory in five dimensions um, you know, cannot be UV completed in directly in five dimensions, but it can most naturally be UV completed in six dimensions in, in terms of the maximally supersymmetric 2-0 theory 
which we then compactify in a circle to flow down to 5D maximally supersymmetric angles. Um, but if, even if you didn't know that, this algebraic argument would immediately tell you that there is no way to UV complete this theory directly in five dimensions because there would, there's no candidate superconformal algebra that, uh, that would uh, allow the UV completion. And we'll encounter a somewhat similar situation with uh, 1 comma 1 supersymmetry in six dimensions. Okay, are there any more questions about this 5D case before we move on to the other cases? Sorry, actually, you know what, before we do that, maybe this is a good opportunity for me to, to say a couple of things about um, CFTs in higher dimensions that I wanted to get off my chest now, because I don't think I'll have a lot of time to talk about it later. Um, so uh, we've been discussing CFTs and SCFTs mostly from the point of view of their algebras, and the algebras seem to exist all over the place. Uh, the conformal algebra in particular exists in any dimension. But there's, of course, a, a non-trivial question, which is what dimensions do conformal and superconformal fixed points actually exist in? And historically, the existence of conformal fixed points in more than four dimensions was believed to be impossible, um, essentially because if you live in a world based on Lagrangians, where you start with some free fixed point and then perturb it by marginal or relevant operators. Remember, that was option one that we discussed yesterday for how to build a, a UV complete quantum field theory. You start with a free theory and then you perturb it by marginal or relevant operators. If you try to do that, uh, it turns out you can only produce interacting fixed points in four or lower dimensions. Uh, that's why, in, you know, standard Wilsonian quantum field theory and, and in, in the theory of critical phenomena, four is always the upper critical dimension. You don't get interesting critical behavior typically in more than four dimensions. And <clears throat> you can write down what looks like interacting Lagrangians in higher dimensions, but they will always have some sort of disease, some sort of instability or some problem like that. Um, so the standard lore uh, was that interacting CFTs in more than four dimensions don't exist. But the, one of the great surprises of sort of non-perturbative string theory from the mid-90s was that uh, people did discover evi strong evidence for the existence of interacting superconformal fixed points in higher dimensions, in particular in five and six dimensions. And as always, the, these, these were found by you know, taking some brains and typically sticking them on some singularity or something like that. Um, and then the crucial ingredient was the observation that you could decouple <coughs> gravity by taking the Planck mass to infinity, but in some cases you would still be left with a non-trivial interacting theory, uh, for example, on the brains. And using that type of logic, people constructed interacting fixed points in 5D and in 6D. Um, and because you decoupled the Planck mass, the interpretation that was uh, arrived at, and that was emphasized by many people, including notably Cyber, was that these are really ordinary local quantum field theories, not some sort of weird string theory. Um, so these should be thought of as isolated, strongly coupled fixed points in, in higher dimensions, and, uh, and uh, because of what I said before, they cannot be described by flowing from a weakly coupled Lagrange because such a flow would not end up at an interesting interacting fixed point. And, and that's the reason that these theories are also known as non-Lagrangian, because we do not have a description starting from a weakly coupled Lagrangian that flows to them in the infrared. Okay. Maybe then I'll leave it at that. And now we can move on to the other cases, and that will also answer your question. So let, let's superficially look at the other cases a little bit. Um, so here um, we have an SO group, which looks good, but, um, but the supercharge is in a vector of the SO. And that's not good because we want it to be a spinner. And this is, this is the, the reason why what you suggested doesn't work. And in fact, it looks kind of hopeless because it, it looks like this thing is never going to want to be a spinner. <laughs> 
And the same problem is down here. I mean, here we don't even have an S, down here we don't even have an SL group. We have SU groups. So if you look at this from 10,000 feet, you'll conclude that, in fact, none of these algebras would give you sensible superconformal algebras, um, except, except this F4 one. Now, that's, that's clearly stupid because we have already constructed examples of free superconformal theories, namely free particle, free massless particle multiplets. So we discussed in detail the four-dimensional case, but the uh, analogous analysis in other dimensions shows you that free massless particles exist and, and make sense. So, so it has to be that there's a sensible superconformal algebra for them, at least for some of them. And uh, what we're saved by here is the fact that we already used when we discussed the ordinary supersymmetry algebras uh, a couple of lectures ago, which is that Lie algebras of low rank enjoy a number of interesting uh, exceptional isomorphisms. So sometimes a Lie algebra of one name with some rank is isomorphic or equivalent to a Lie algebra with some other name or some other, with some other label. And that's going to produce, in a few special cases, from this general list, superconformal algebras that satisfy this requirement. But very importantly, this trick will only work in a few special cases. And it'll turn out to only work in low dimensions. And so this is what eventually will lead us to the conclusion that, that superconformal algebras only exist in six dimensions or lower, and you can't go above six dimensions. And this, is, this, this is morally the explanation for why I didn't uh, decide to continue the discussion of supersymmetry algebras beyond six dimensions to begin with. OK, so let's see how this work for, works, for example, using the OSP series over here. Yes, please. Correct that uh, for five dimension, we are super, I mean, there is no superconformal field theory greater than n equal to one that has UV completion in five dimension. Uh, the, I mean, you don't need to say the word. You, when you say superconformal field theory, it's already yeah, UV yeah. complete. Yeah. There is no superconformal field theory with any amount of supersymmetry other than one. In five right. So there's no extended Suzuki theory that has a UV completion in five dimensions. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's see what we can do with this um, OSP thing over here. Well, um, look at the SP factor, right? So we, ha we have an SP2n for any little n, and so we can make SP2, SP4, SP6, etc. So starting with SP6 and higher, there's nothing to be gained here. But uh, SP2 and SP4 are special. In particular, remember that SP4 is isomorphic to SO5. And we use that even when we wrote down spinners and the SUSY algebra in five dimensions. The reason we did that is that the spinner of SO5, which is four dimensional, under this equivalence is mapped to the box, the fundamental of SP4. This is why we viewed spinners in five dimensions as fundamental SP4 representations to begin with. Uh, so using this isomorphism, we can take this class of superalgebras and make candidate superconformal algebras. Namely, we can take OSP M slash 4, and that has bosonic subalgebra SO M times SP4, which is the same as SO5, which is SO3 plus 2. So this, um, because of this comment over here, is the right SO group to be a superconformal algebra in three space time dimensions. And because of this equivalence over here, the supercharges do indeed transform as a spinner under it. And the other factor is SOM, which is exactly the right R symmetry that we said had to, had to be present in three dimensions. So now you see that this little m here is, is just script m, the number of supercharges. So OSP script m slash 4 is a candidate superconformal algebra in three dimensions, the unique superconformal algebra in three dimensions with n extended supersymmetry. 
And now we have a nice infinite series of algebras for every script n that can describe these theories. And that's good because if you remember, I gave you an exercise to check that uh, three massless particle multiplets exist for any n in three dimensions. So each of them have to be described by one of these. Good. So we have superconformal algebras in three dimensions. That's excellent because there are lots of interesting superconformal field theories there. Um, now we're going to do the same thing in four dimensions, and we're going to try to use an exceptional isomorphism associated with SU. Okay. And the only um, the only interesting isomorphism that we will need. Here. The, the only isomorphism that we'll need is the one that relates um, SU4 and SO6. So as Lie algebras, SU4 and SO6 are the same, and remember that we use that when we discuss the six-dimensional supersymmetry algebra and its spinners. So SU4 is SO6, and in particular, the fundamental of SU4 maps to a chiral spinner of SO6. So if I take the SUM slash N series and I make N4, then I really get bosonic subalgebra SUM times SO6 and maybe also an additional U1 factor depending on whether or not M is 4. Um, and the supercharges are fundamentals of SUM and spinners of SO6. In fact, chiral spinners of SO6. So that's good, because SO6 can be the right algebra that's needed to describe superconformal theories in four dimensions. So this set of superalgebras um, has all the properties that you would expect to find in 4D superconformal algebras. Supercharges transform correctly under the space-time symmetries. And you see the R symmetries also work out. Now you have an extra SUM bosonic uh, symmetry under which the Qs transform as fundamentals. And that was exactly the R symmetry that we expected in four dimensions. And as a small bonus, you get the following additional insight about the U1. You see that when M is generic, there is not just an SUM symmetry, but also a U1R symmetry under which the supercharges transform, except when M is 4. Because when M is 4, I, I remember I told you that the U1 becomes central and, 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 and uninteresting. And, um, and that's something that you are familiar with from, from 4D n equals 2 for supersymmetric Young Mills theory. Those theories only have an SU4R symmetry, not a U4R symmetry. So that, that fact algebraically comes from this. Good. So now we have, just as in three dimensions, an infinite <coughs> sequence of superconformal algebras. And just as before, we identify the label little m with the label script n that counts the number of Susies. So, so far, we have used two exceptional isomorphisms. And, uh, and we've covered three dimensions and four dimensions. Five we already discussed. And now in the next case, we want to discuss the six dimensions. So because if we are in six dimensions, the SO group we want to discuss is SO8. But SO8, unfortunately, doesn't enjoy any exceptional isomorphisms. There's no other Lie algebra that SO8 is equivalent to other than SO8. Um, so our program seems to be grinding to a halt. Um, but fortunately, for SO8, there's one more miraculous property that will save the day. Um, and it's the last dimension where anything exceptional happens. Beyond six dimensions, there's no more uh, magic to, to guarantee the existence of superconformal algebras. And the special property of SO8 that we will need to use is the fact that it enjoys a triality, outer, uh, outer automorphism. 
So we're in six dimensions. Uh, and we're looking at SO8. And if you remember, the Dinkin diagram of SO8 looks a little bit like the Mercedes star. It's ranked four, it has four nodes like this. Um, and there is an S3 outer automorphism that permutes all these, mo all these nodes. And each, nodes, uh, each node uh, stands for a, uh, an eight dimensional fundamental representation of <laughs> SO8. So of course, SO8 has an eight dimensional vector representation. That's the fundamental representation of SO8. But interestingly, uh, and very much related to this, um, the dimension of the chiral spinners in eight dimension is also eight. Right? A Dirac spinner in eight dimension has 16 components, and the left and right chiral spinner have eight components. So there are two spinners, usually denoted 8s and 8c, like spinner and conjugates. Something like that. Um, so this is one spinner, and this is another spinner. Let's say left and right, and this spinner. And the triality automorphism exchanges all of them. Yeah, the S3 exchanges all of them. So using this S3, you can turn a vector into a left-handed spinner, into a right-handed spinner, and so forth. So that's good news, because now we can play our game uh, starting with this superalgebra here, OSPM slash 2N, where we set M equals to 8. So if we look at OSP 8 slash 2N, we find that this has a bosonic SO8 times SP 2N subgroup, and the spinners, the super sorry, the supercharges right now are in vectors of the 8, and also fundamentals of the SP 2N. So the fact that they're in vectors before bothered us, because we wanted spinners. But because of this, you see that we can choose a triality frame, which is nothing but a change of basis at the end of the day, um, to turn the vector either into a left-handed spinner or into a right-handed spinner. But the important thing is that you only get to play this game once. Once you choose your basis for SO8 and your triality frame, you've committed, right? And so you can't make different choices for some spinners and for other spinners, which means either all the cues will be vectors, or they will all be spinners, or they will all be right. Sorry, all, they will all be left-handed spinners, or they will all be right-handed spinners. Uh, and that means you can't get supercharges of different chiralities. Right? If you choose a triality frame in which the supercharges are chiral spinners, which is what we want then you have to commit to either left or right chirality. Now, which one you pick is irrelevant because they're related by parity and so forth. But all the supercharges need to be uh, one chirality. And so what that means is that you'll end up with a, an algebra that is appropriate for chiral n comma zero supersymmetry or perhaps the parity conjugate zero comma n. Right? And this n here is the same as the little n here. And that's good, because we said that the um, R symmetry in six dimensions was an SP for the left superchargers and a different SP for the right superchargers. Here we don't have right superchargers, so we just have an SPN, SP2N for the left ones, and that's exactly what this superalgebra contains. So this OSP8 slash 2N is exactly the right thing to be a superconformal algebra in six dimensions. It also exists for any script n. And importantly, we have learned that it only produces chiral supersymmetry algebras. 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, et cetera. And again, there are many, many interesting string constructions in six dimensions that lead to superconformal theories with this kind of supersymmetry, for example, the famous 2 comma 0 theories in six dimensions. Um, but just as in five dimensions, there are also interesting non-trivial quantum systems that have a supersymmetry algebra that is not compatible with this chiral form. 
For example, if you take maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory in six dimensions, its supersymmetry algebra is one comma one. It has one left moving supercharge and one right moving supercharge. And just like we said for the n equals two theory in five dimensions, there's no candidate uh, six dimensional superconformal algebra that you could ever embed one comma one supersymmetry into. So if you ever encounter a maximally supersymmetric Young Mills theory in six dimensions, you know that it cannot possibly come from a uh, a superconformal fixed point in six dimensions it has to have some other type of UV completion, for example, a little string theory or something like that. So again, we learned something non-trivial about physics just from the algebra. Okay, very good. So this uh, concludes our survey of superconformal algebras, and the upshot of this discussion is that because of the magic of exceptional automorphisms, there are superconformal algebras in three, four, and six dimensions for any n, and there's a unique superconformal algebra in five dimensions, um, and above six dimensions, there's none. So this is why the only superconformal field theories that have been discovered have been in dimension six or less. Now, you could ask, um, is it conceivable that there are interacting conformal field theories in more than six dimensions? And of course, because of what I just said, these would necessarily not be supersymmetric. Uh, and the answer is we have no clue. Because as I told you, the only way we have to construct interacting superconformal field theories in high dimensions in the first place is to take some decoupling limits of string theories. And if you want to have control over these kind of constructions, supersymmetry is absolutely essential. So, uh, so that's an interesting open problem on, on which there has been very little progress. Okay. Um, before I move on to the next topic, I want to um, reconcile a small point of tension uh, between this discussion of superconformal algebras and the free field discussion we had. Um, and that will give me the opportunity to introduce a few concepts that, that I wanted to, to know about. So when we discussed three fields, there was an interesting constraint on the helicity coming from, from the existence of a stress tensor, coming from the weinberg witten theorem. And that meant that the total number of supercharges, at least in most dimensions, were limited to be at most 16. But in our discussion of superconformal algebras, we haven't really seen this constraint yet. In most cases, in three, four, and six dimensions, they exist for any n and therefore any NQ, um, except in 5D, where there was a unique one to begin with. So how, how do superconformal field theories know, if you wish, about the constraints coming from the weinberg witten theorem? Well, there's a clue, which is that the weinberg witten theorem itself followed from the existence of a stress tensor. So it's probably good advice to think about the stress tensor in superconformal field theories. That's generally good advice, as you know from false lectures. So in any CFT, as you by now know, there is a stress tensor which is both symmetric, conserved, and that's true for any uh, CFT, regardless of whether or not it is a superconformal theory. Um, what happens in a superconformal theory? Well, um, just like supersymmetry impl implies that particles lie in supermultiplets, superconformal theory symmetry implies that uh, the stress tensor uh, is accompanied by a bunch of other operators uh, that are bound together in a single superconformal multiplet, uh, and the different operators are related by the action of the Q and the S supercharges. So in, in bosonic conformal field theories, without supersymmetry, T would just be accompanied in a big S O D comma two multiplet by all of its descendants. You would just get T and derivatives of T, but no other oper no other new primary operators would show up. In a superconformal theory, because you have Qs, uh, and S's, you can generate new conformal primaries. And some of the interesting conformal primaries that 
sit in the same multiplet as T are the currents J mu alpha i that when you integrate them over space give rise to the supersymmetry charges. Right? I mean the supercharges themselves are conserved charges so they better arise from some conserved current. And that, that is a spin three halves current, conserved traceless spin three halves current with this index structure um, that also sits in the same supermultiplet as the stress tensor. And similarly, we saw that all superconformal theories have an R symmetry algebra, almost all, have a continuous R symmetry. And for that reason, you also need to have some neutral currents for the R symmetry. These are ordinary spin one vector currents, and these are the R symmetry currents. They also reside in the same superconformal multiplet as the stress tensor. Uh, these are the only operators that you can say exist for sure because, uh, because they have to integrate to give you some charges that you already know were there. But it turns out that in order to complete the supermultiplet, it's essentially always necessary to add even more operators that are not necessarily conserved current. So this supermultiplet contains a bunch of other operators, and then it makes a nice representation of the superconformal algebra. So this is the, this is the so-called stress tensor supermultiplet, or superconformal multiplet. Sometimes it's also called a supercurrent. Anyway, and it's a nice unitary superconformal representation. Now, um, we haven't heard too much about the representation theory of either the conformal or the superconformal algebras just yet, but I guess you're going to hear a little bit more about the conformal case tomorrow. Um, but unitarity and the structure of the conformal algebra imposes strong restrictions on the structure of possible multiplets. So not any collection of operators with any number of, of friends and any scaling dimensions are allowed. There are certain rigid constraints. And in, um, and the representation theory of the conformal algebra is extremely well understood. And the representation theory of the superconformal algebras, I would say, is also very well understood at this point. So we, we are more or less able to write down a complete list of all the unitary representations of superconformal algebras. This, by the way, is a lot easier than writing down sensible representations of just the supersymmetry algebra without conformal part, um, because the superconformal algebras are algebraically so much nicer. They're compact in some moral sense. OK, so for all intents and purposes, you can go somewhere and produce a list of all unitary representations of whatever conformal algebra you're interested in. And you can check whether that list contains a multiplet with these operators in it that have these properties. That's something you should absolutely demand, right? If you have a stress tensor and its superpartners of this form, then they have to sit in some multiplet of the superconformal symmetry, just by virtue of existing. And then the question is, is whether such a multiplet exists and is compatible with the constraints of unitarity. And it turns out that the answer is not always yes. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no. Um, and it turns out that imposing that constraint is what cuts down the allowed values of n in the cases where we know they have to be cut down. So for example, in six dimensions, you can show that stress tensor multiplets only exist when n is 1 or n is 2. So we can only have one zero or two zero superconformal field theory. And that is exactly what you expect from this constraint that the number of supercharges should be less than 16. That gives you n equals 1 or n equals 2 in six dimensions. And those are precisely the theories we know how to construct, for example, from string theory. There are no 3, 0 superconformal field theories. There are 3, 0 superconformal algebras, but there are no local sensible quantum field theories with that amount of supersymmetry because they wouldn't uh, have a sensible stress tensor. So this, roughly speaking, is the analog of the weinberg witten constraint in the context of conformal and superconformal field theory. And uh, a similar 
comment applies to four dimensions. You can also use the same argument to show that in four dimensions, superconformal theories only exist with 16 or less supercharges, so n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, and in three dimensions, the story is a little more interesting because, as I've said a few times by now, even free particles can have arbitrarily large n. Uh, so there's a small caveat there, but um, I think in the interest of time, I will move on. If you're curious, you can ask me. Good. So we've had some time now to get a big overview of supersymmetry and superconformal symmetry and more or less all interesting dimensions. I've left out two, uh, which is also very interesting because it's somewhat special. Um, and uh, along the way, I've mentioned a few examples here and there of some interesting supersymmetric and superconformal field theories, but we haven't really put our fingers on an actual example yet. Um, so for the rest of the lectures, I want to spend some time just discussing elementary examples in four dimensions. Yes, please. DS3 symmetry to make Q the spinner? Yeah. So do you, don't you have to do anything with the group SO8, like taking quotient of SO8? So S3, <coughs> the S3 is not a symmetry, of, and it's not part of SO8. It's something that acts on SO8. That's why it's an outer automorphism. It, you should think of it like some analog of complex conjugation. If you take like SU3, for example, uh, complex conjugation is not an SU3 generator maps the fundamental to the anti-fundamental. But it is an outer automorphism. So it's a relabeling of the generators and the representations. That's one-to-one. -one, so. um, but you're right. I mean, you, once you pick, once you make this choice, you have picked your frame, and then, then you have restricted your further choice. That was exactly the point that led to the conclusion that you couldn't have both parallel and anti parallel supercharges. So we have discussed free particles, free massless particles, um, which is almost as good as discussing free field theories. But we haven't yet written down any supersymmetric Lagrangians in terms of fields. And so I want to spend a little bit of time doing that and use some elementary examples to illustrate some sort of important universal features of supersymmetric theories. Um, that will perhaps make you appreciate why they're interesting and, and why people keep studying them. So we'll spend a little bit of time developing some very bare bones formalism to do that, not, not in too much detail. So we probably won't actually get to write down proper Lagrangians until tomorrow, but we'll do a little bit of the legwork. So recall that if you want to write down a Lorentz invariant, translation invariant, Poincare invariant quantum field theory, local quantum field theory, you do that by introducing fields, and then you write an action that's a integral of a lo local Lagrangian density. Um, which, if you, if you wish, you can it's, think of a, a field in its own right, the scalar, scalar local operator, at least in most cases. Uh, I remind you we're in four dimensions from now on. And, and this, this thing all automatically spits out a um, relativistically invariant quantum field theory as long as all the fields transform suitably covariantly. So for example, let's, let's, let's remind ourselves how this works for translations. Why is this thing translationally invariant? Well, all fields in any theory we, we discuss have the property that their commutator with the momentum generators is just a derivative. 
This is just the relativistic version of the Heisenberg equation of motion in quantum mechanics. It's totally unavoidable. And um, once you accept this, that every field, every local field, O of x, has this commutation relation with P, then the same is true for the Lagrangian itself, which is a product of local fields and the local field in its own right. Okay? So what that means is that um, if you want to check the translational invariant of the theory, all you need to do is check that the action is translationally invariant. But under translations, the Lagrangian transforms by a total derivative, and then that total derivative is killed by the integral over space-time. So this is a very coarse-grained version of why um, it's good to construct relativistic Lagrangians using local fields. There are many, many other reasons to do so as well. So if this is the logic that works for translations, we can ask ourselves if a similar logic might also work for supersymmetry, since after all, from the supersymmetry algebra, we are short of intuiting that the supercharges are, roughly speaking, the square root of translations. So what we would like to, to develop in a little bit of detail is a setup in which we can write a formula like this for an action that depends on some fields that realizes the supercharges in some straightforward way uh, via differential operators, much like the momentum uh, operator acting on local fields here was realized just by the ordinary space-time derivative. And in order to do that, we need to introduce some auxiliary construction called superspace. By the way, I should say that superspace is not the only route to deriving supersymmetric Lagrangians by a long shot. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you learn about superspace, space, it seems like this is you know, the, only, the only way to do it. That's, that's not at all true. You're, you're free to do it a million other ways. But this is a particularly clean and easy way that works, uh, especially in 4D, with, with low amounts of supersymmetry. And, uh, and so that's, that's the route that I'm going to follow. But it's by no means the only route. So superspace, in particular the n equals 1 4D superspace that I'll be using, um, involves extending space-time by an additional Grassmann spinner theta alpha, which is a left-handed vial fermion. And this is an anti-commuting Grassmann variable. And since you're in a Lorentzian signature, there's also theta bar, which is just a complex conjugate or emission conjugate. So for, we, we formally introduce this coordinate theta, and we upgrade space-time <coughs> to this collection of variables. And then we make the following definition. A superfield, S of x mu theta alpha theta alpha dot, is a function of superspace um, that satisfies the following condition. Um, you take the commutator of S with Q and Q bar, and in order to package the commutator of Q with, uh, uh, with S and Q bar with S into a single object, it's convenient to introduce some uh, auxiliary spinner parameter that let me call it zeta alpha, um, that you can think of as an infinitesimal supersymmetry parameter that I'm going to contract into Q alpha. And both zeta and Q alpha are anti-commuting. So zeta is just a Grassmann parameter. And zeta and, and Q is the, is the usual supercharge. So both of them are fermions, but zeta is a, um, is, is, is a number 
the Grassmann number versus while well, well, Q is an actual operator. And then I'm going to complex conjugate it like so. And once I do that, it's useful to raise this index over here. So this is just a, a repackaged version of the commutator of Q with S and Q bar with S, um, which, which is what you need to compute if you want to compute the supersymmetry transformation of S, right? This is the analog of the commutator of P with O over here. Okay, so this is the left-hand side. The right-hand side of the equality is some gadget that is a differential operator uh, on superspace. So I'm going to write that schematically right now as follows. I'm going to introduce some object boldface Q and boldface Q bar, which acts on S. And I haven't told you what these are yet, but what I want them to be are superspace differential operators. So things that involve derivatives with respect to x or theta or theta bar. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to mimic this formula over here. <coughs> this is the definition. This is what I mean by a superfield. OK. So of course, if you make such a definition, then there are some consistency conditions because the Q's and Q bars obey some algebra. Right? The Q's and Q bars obey the 4D n equals to 1 supersymmetry algebra. Let me remind you what it looks like. Q and Q bar anti-commute to 2 sigma p, and q with q is 0, and q bar with q bar is also 0. So by taking a double commutator here on the left and using this formula twice, you'll, you'll find that the q's have to satisfy some uh, non-trivial anti-commutation relations themselves. And then you have to choose the q's such that those conditions are satisfied. So let me write down what the Q's look like for you, and then we'll check that they satisfy the right anti-commutation relations. Q is dd alpha minus i sigma mu alpha beta dot beta bar upper beta dot and then a space time derivative. I'll just write as d mu. This is just a d dx mu. And q bar alpha dot is minus d d theta alpha dot. Right, this is theta bar. Um, plus, I think, plus i theta beta sigma mu um, beta alpha dot d mu. Can everybody read that? So these are just combinations of derivatives and Grassmann parameters. And the first thing one can check is that these differential operators, as differential operators on S's, satisfy the anti-commutation relation Q, uh, boldface Q alpha, boldface Q beta dot is, I think, 2i sigma mu alpha beta dot d mu. How does this come about? Well, the commutator eh, of differential operators exactly as in quantum mechanics uh, always arises when some differ, uh, differential operator acts from the left on some uh, coordinate. So that happens twice here. So you can take the differential operator dd alpha sitting in Q, and that can act on the theta coordinate here in, um, in Q bar. 
So that will give you a uh, factor of i. Then d theta alpha of theta beta gives you a delta function. And then you're left with this sigma matrix. Um, so you say if you use this delta function, you get the right sigma matrix, but without the factor of two. The factor of two comes from the uh, cam comes from the other ordering of the anti-commutator. Okay, so there's one more term from the other ordering of the anti-commutator, and that comes when uh, Q bar sits on the left and dd theta bar acts on this theta bar coordinate over here. So if you're not convinced by this, please check. And you get this formula here with the right factor of two. Okay. And using this formula, which is a formula for differential operators acting on superspace, you can check that this formula here, which has operatorial supercharges on the left-hand side and superspace differential operators on the right-hand side is actually consistent with the supersymmetry algebra. So it's a consistent representation of the supersymmetry algebra. The way you do this is you take a, another Suzy commutator on both sides. Then on the left-hand side, you use the Jacobi identity and the supersymmetry algebra to evaluate that. And on the right-hand side, you uh, move the supercharges through the differential operators, have them act on S, evaluate again, and then you can reduce it to this superspace expression. And you will see that you get the same uh, derivative formula on, the left, on both sides. So this is, this is an important consistency check that you should do. This is always true, by the way, uh, when in many examples that you're familiar with, when you realize uh, symmetry charges by differential operators. For example, when you uh, realize the, um, not just the translations, but also the Lorentz generators by uh, differential operators, then the differential operators of the Lorentz and translation generators have to essentially satisfy the same algebra as the original charges P and J themselves. Depending on your definition, there may be a minus sign or some I, but, uh, but up, up to that. I'll have to satisfy the same algebra. Okay. So that's, that's a superfield. And now let me say a couple of obvious things that will be useful. Um, if S is a superfield, then it's clear that the space-time the space, uh, the space -time derivative of S is also a superfield. Right? So if S is a superfield, then d mu S is also a superfield because if I hit this equation with a space-time derivative, it just moves through everything. Right? Space-time derivative is bosonic. It doesn't uh, have any problem going through the Grafman variables here. Uh, it doesn't get acted on by them either. So you can just hit this whole equation with a space-time derivative and conclude that the uh, d mu s transforms in exactly the same way as s. The same is true for products of superfields. If you have two S's, two different S's that satisfy this, then their product will also satisfy this. So you can multiply superfield. However, the thing you cannot do is take theta derivatives of S. If you take a theta derivative of S or a theta bar derivative of S, then this formula no longer applies. And you can see that explicitly because if you try to hit this equation with dd theta, there are a bunch of thetas here in the Q's and Q bars here and here. And uh, trying to anti-commute the dd theta through will give you extra terms that spoil this equation. So one question we need to answer is, is there a sensible way to take a dd theta derivative or something like a dd theta derivative that sends a superfield to a superfield? And for that, we need to introduce what are called uh, superspace covariant derivatives. Uh, those are usually denoted d and d bar. And they look exactly like q and q bar, except there's a small sign split. So you take exactly the same formula as before, except you change the sign in the middle. This minus i becomes a plus i. And down here, the plus i becomes a minus i. Uh, 
And now uh, you can check that the these with this definition and with these signs have the nice properties that any d or d bar anti-commutes with any q or q bar. So d with q is 0, d with q bar is 0, d bar with q is 0, etc. All, all permutations of this kind. And that means that you can now take this formula for the super shear transformation of S, hit it with D or D bar on both sides, and just anti-commute the Ds through until they land on S. So with this definition of D and D bar, the same argument that showed that the ordinary space-time derivative of a superfield is a superfield also works for the supercovariant derivatives. So D alpha of S and D bar alpha dot of S are superfields. Fantastic. OK, so the last thing I want to do today, I think I have five more minutes. Sure. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to do today is to explain to you what is the relation between superfields such as S of x, theta, theta bar, and ordinary uh, local operators or local fields like O of x. So, so far, this was just some formalism that we introduced. Um, and I, we haven't really reaped the benefits of introducing it just yet. But before we do that, let me just explain the relationship of this gadget with ordinary local operators. So, as you probably remember, any function of Grassmann coordinates is actually just a finite polynomial in these coordinates. From a formal point of view, you can think of expanding this thing in a Taylor series in theta and theta bar with coefficient functions that depend on x. But because theta and theta bar are Grassmann, this Taylor series will always uh, terminate. So it'll just be a polynomial in the thetas and theta bars. Um, and that's how you turn a superfield into a bunch of ordinary fields. So let's see how that works. Basically, we're just going to write out the Taylor series. And then we're going to use it to do one thing. So S of x theta and theta bar, well, it starts with some thing that doesn't depend on theta and theta bar. That's the zeroth order term in the Taylor series. Let me call it C. You could also imagine, by the way, adding uh, spinner indices to all the equations that I write so that you can get, give them some Lorentz structure. That won't change anything I say. OK, so then you continue with the Taylor series. There's going to be some term proportional to theta times something that can contract with theta. And that thing will be some fermion, psi alpha of x. Why is that? Because the, the overall superfield has to have uniform index structure. So for example, here I've chosen not to put any indices on my s. So s is a scalar superfield. That means every term in this Taylor expansion has to be a scalar. So here I get a scalar. Here I get theta alpha contracted into a fermion psi alpha of the same chirality. Again, and, th and this is now a local field, a local fermion field that depends only on x. And then I keep going, theta bar chi, theta and theta bar. Now, theta and theta bar is a bispinner. And remember that a bispinner was the same as a vector. Uh, so you can use a sigma matrix, if you wish, to turn this into a vector. And then you see that your superfield contains a vector operator somewhere in the middle. And then you keep going. Now you can have three thetas. Well, so you can have two thetas and one theta bar. We usually write like that or two theta bars and one theta. And finally, there's a single term with four theta. We call it d of x. That's it. There's only four thetas, right? Two thetas and two theta bars, and so I can't keep going beyond this point. If I multiply this by another theta, I'll get zero. So this is what's called a long superfield, a long or unconstrained superfield. This is the maximal number of, of component fields that you can have in a given superfield. By the way, I should emphasize that these gadgets here, C of x, 
psi of x and so forth. All the coefficients in this Taylor expansion are called the component fields of the superfield S. And you see that there are a lot of them because every term gets its own coefficients and, the, and it's unconstrained, meaning there, nothing is set to zero and there are no relations imposed between any of these fields. And the reason I've written the coefficient of theta bar squared and theta squared as d of x is that this is usually called a d term. D term is by definition just the top component of a long superfield. That's the terminology that's fairly standard in all dimensions. D term is always a uh, top component of, a, of an unconstrained superfield. Okay. Now, one thing that I want to uh, point out, although I won't have time to explain in detail, is that um, the definition of the superfield immediately tells you how to compute the supersymmetry transformation of the component field. Right? Because this formula tells you what the commutator of the supercharge is Q and Q bar with the superfield is. It's just obtained by acting with a superspace differential operator. So if you apply this formula to this component expansion, then the left-hand side will tell you commutators of Q and Q bar with each of the individual component fields. And the right-hand side will be some differential operator in superspace, some of these Q and Q bar differential operators over there, acting on this map. And if you equate the, both, uh, the two sides and match coefficients in the theta expansion, then, then each of these coefficients will tell you the Q and Q bar variation of the individual component fields. For example, uh, if you want a small exercise, then you can check that uh, um, I think So the Q and Q bar commutator of C of X, which is the bottom component, gives you either psi when you take the commutator with Q, or it gives you chi bar when you take the commutator with Q bar. And then you, by equating higher coefficients, you can derive the uh, commutation relations of all of the component fields. OK, very good. I'm out of time. So uh, we'll stop here. And, uh, Tomorrow, uh, I'll explain how to use superfields to write down supersymmetric Lagrangians, mostly for chiral multiplets. And then we'll discuss a couple of remarkable properties of chiral multiplets in four dimensions. So thank you. Any questions? Questions or comments? Is this construction only valid in uh, n equals to 1, or can be extended to n equals to 2, or it, 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 In some cases, it can be extended to um, higher n. Um, so th th this, this, answer, this question has sort of two, two parts to the answer. The, 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 this construction that I described so far can be straightforwardly extended to any n. Uh, the question is whether the resulting superfields that you define in this way will, will be useful whether they will give you representations of supersymmetry that you care about. And that's where the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. For example, if you do this uh, in n equals two theories, you get a nice superspace with some additional i indices, because now, now there are two supercharges. So there'll be some SU2 doublet indices that label the two supercharges. And everything I've said so far works beautifully. Um, however, if you want to then define uh, useful multiplets, uh, not just long multiplets, which I'll explain tomorrow are not that useful. Um, it turns out that you can define very beautifully all the multiplets you need to deal with uh, pure gauge theories, pure n equals 2 gauge theories, so vector multiplets. But once you introduce hypermultiplets, uh, the formalism doesn't really work very well at all. So, uh, so this particular version of superspace is not good, for example, for, for describing um, n equals 2 theories with hypermultiplet maps. Then, if you want, you can go to 
more elaborate and, and more uh, complicated versions of superspace. But uh, yeah, I should say that uh, there are also cases where superspace doesn't really exist at all in any useful sense. So it's a very dimension and end dependent um, question. Um, should there not also be F terms in this expression? Well, um, an uh, F term is uh, not something that um, makes a lot of sense if I'm only discussing long multiples. Uh, the, okay. the thing that is usually called an F term is the top component of a half BPS multiple. So that's what we're going to discuss tomorrow. There are multiplets that where all, where all these operators, d, rho, and lambda, and, and even in v to some extent, uh, are absent. Oh, sorry, you're, you're, you're saying something yeah. more, more, more basic. I just forgot to write them. Right, yeah. Ah, thanks. That's uh, very important. Uh, th there are terms in the Taylor expansion that I missed, namely the terms with two thetas and two theta bars. That's uh, very good. I'm glad you fixed. You caught that. So there's a term with two thetas, which let's say will multiply, we'll multiply f, and then, then there's a term with two theta bars, which let's say will multiply g. Um, and so that's great, thank you very much. The, uh, but the comment I wanted to make is that at the level of the long multiplet, these terms are not particularly special. Uh, they will become special if we somehow manage to kill all the higher terms in the multiplet, because then the f term will be kind of similar to the d term in the long multiplet. And so that will happen if we have half VPS possible. Other question? Okay, if not, then.